Here we look at Alfred Marshall's Laws of Derived Demand. The plot of the famous novel, The Grapes of Wrath, follows those laws. The novel's about Oklahoma for arm laborers in the 1930s. The demand for their labor was a derived demand because consumers did not want their work per se, but the food that their labor produced. Then tractors came along so that each farm laborer could produce more food or, equivalently, less labor was needed to produce each unit of food. Of course, if you read the book or watch Henry Fonda in the film, you know that the result was less demand for farm labor. The rest of the plot is how the labor moves to alternative regions and industries. But Marshall's laws tell us more about why that happened and why in other circumstances automation can actually increase an industry's demand for labor. I prepared these slides for my Economics of Socialism class, where we have an obvious interest in the consequences of capital accumulation and technical change for workers' wages. But the formulas used here are from our Chicago Price Theory book. Automation has two effects on an industry's demand for labor, the scale effect and the substitution effect. Either one can dominate depending on the circumstances. Here we are looking at isoquants for the industry, say agriculture, which are the various combinations of capital and labor that would produce the same amount of food. Let's begin at the green square and then add some automation to the industry. The industry ends up at the blue dot. I have deliberately drawn this so it is difficult to see whether there is more or less labor because it can go either way. Geometrically, it is the question of whether the blue dot is above or below the green square. Marshall, and also Sir John Hicks, decomposes the change from green to blue into two pieces, which are the scale and substitution effects. The scale effect reflects the fact that consumers demand more food because automation makes the food cheaper but it does not reflect any change in the relative amounts of capital amounts of capital and labor used in the production process. The substitution effect reflects the fact that automation makes production less labor intensive, but does not reflect any change in the amount of production. The full effect is the combination of the two. We can look at the scale effect in a simple supply and demand diagram. If the services of capital get cheaper, such as tractors replacing horses, then the food gets cheaper. The exact amount is the product of how much cheaper is capital and the share of capital in total factor costs. When food is cheaper, consumers buy more and farmers produce more. The additional amount is the product of the price change and the price elasticity of the demand for food. The price change itself is the product we showed earlier. So that's the formula for the scale effect. Remember that epsilon d is negative because demand slopes down. Let's go back to the isochron diagram for the substitution effect. We know that additional output is achieved with a combination of additional labor and additional capital, weighted by their shares. By definition of the substitution effect, there is no additional output. This equation therefore tells us how much labor has to go down for each amount that capital goes up or vice versa. The elasticity of substitution tells us how the slope of the isochron changes with the labor capital ratio. As producers minimize cost, the slope of the isochron is also the ratio of the rental rates of labor and capital, which I denote as W and R respectively. In other words, the substitution effect is described by two simultaneous equations that can be solved for two unknowns. Here we solve for the changes, percentage changes, in capital and labor. This tells us exactly where the blue dot is relative to the original labor capital ratio. That's the blue arrow. Moreover, each of the conditions we started with describe a different part of the geometry. The first one tells us the direction of the blue arrow. It tells us exactly how much it points to the right for each unit that it points down. 
The second condition tells us the length of the blue arrow. The greater is the elasticity of substitution, the further we move along the isocant. The sum of the two effects gives us the formula capturing Marshall's laws. We focus on the first law. Does making capital cheaper, represented by a negative delta R, increase or decrease the demand for labor? It depends on the relative scale and substitution effects. I put the scale effect in green and the substitution effect in blue. They have opposite signs because the factor substitution elasticity is positive while the slope of the final demand curve is negative. First I showed you the geometry and then the algebra. Here's a third way of looking at the same thing. I got this from Richard Burkhauser, who graduated from the University of Chicago years ago. An industry starts out with four plants, each using capital and labor in equal proportions. Then automation comes along. We model that as lower R. Now there are seven plants operating three quarters with capital. Labor has been cut in half at the plant level. But at the industry level, labor is similar to what it was before. To be exact, labor has gone from four times a half to seven times a quarter. Now back to the grapes of wrath. We know that sigma was not zero because capital was substituted for labor on those Oklahoma farms. There would be more farm output because food got cheaper. But would consumers be willing to eat all of the extra food that farm labor was able to grow? Not for food. It's not that price elastic. You can make food 10 times cheaper, but people won't buy 10 times as much. They will eat some more. They will waste more too, but not 10 times. The consumers take some of their food budget and spend it on other things. So the demand for farm labor dropped a lot. We produced more food with less farm labor, freeing up people to work elsewhere. And remember that the consumers of food use their extra purchasing power to buy other things. Those are the two reasons why the characters in the Grapes of Wrath picked up and moved. But there are other industries where demand is price elastic. Many technology industries are that way. The capital gets better, but still more people are hired because the consumers are buying so much more. The dire predictions for automation on employment ignore the scale effect. And even if the scale effect is not big enough to offset the substitution effect, as it was not for agriculture, eventually those workers are employed elsewhere. Let's look at two other applications of Marshall's Laws. The first is the famous Jevons Paradox. Jevons was writing about 150 years ago when they were figuring out how to use coal more efficiently. In other words, better technology allowed them to produce the same output with less coal. And people at the time focused on the substitution effect saying that the result would be fewer sales of coal. But Jevons said, hey, don't forget about the scale effect. By using less coal per unit output, the price of that output fell and consumers bought more. The extra production resulted in more coal being used in total. The same mistake happens today. The government forces people to buy fuel-efficient cars with the stated intention of reducing the use of gasoline. I think the real reason for these rules is to protect American auto companies, but let's put that aside. But the scale effect, sometimes called the rebound effect by environmental economists, says that people will drive more. They might end up purchasing more gasoline. Regardless, the scale effect is undoing some of the intended effect, which is why economists are much bigger fans of gas taxes than they are of micromanaging the design of automobiles. My last example comes from the opioid epidemic. What people are after in that market, whether they be cancer patients 
or abusers slash recreational users are the morphine-like symptoms. Morphine-like symptoms can be produced with a variety of ingredients. Here I focus on heroin and fentanyl because they have a big market share and are often mixed together. Fentanyl has been around in the U.S. illegal market for a long time, but it was hard to get because law enforcement was pretty tough in terms of shutting down its manufacture and distribution. Until about seven years ago, that is, when the federal government decided that it would no longer prosecute drug dealers. Immediately, fentanyl became easier to get, and the substitution effect went in the direction of more fentanyl in the mix. This made the morphine-like symptoms a lot cheaper. I estimate by, that by 2016, consumers could buy three times as much as they could in 2012 or 2013. The scale effect of this was obvious. You can try to measure the number of people using heroin or fentanyl. There were a lot more. You can easily measure the number of people who died from overdose with one of those drugs in their system. A big increase. While the scale effect is significant, it does not appear to outweigh the substitution effect because less poppy, which is the main heroin ingredient, is grown in Mexico these days.